Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to another hour of mystery and suspense. To a terrifying experiment in supernatural power. An experiment by a retired scientist to direct his wife's subconscious mind to shoot him. Our mystery drama, The Breaking Point, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Hank Warner and stars Roger DeCoven. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free Diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jack. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a car. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl? of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal. And you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it for from 4 to 10 years, minimum deposit, $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings Special Interest Deal in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Ride with me in this ambulance, speeding through the midnight fog across the Golden Gate Bridge to St. Francis Hospital in downtown San Francisco. As the trauma emergency team tries with plasma and oxygen to keep critically wounded Professor William Baker alive, the driver and the two doctors know that the patient must get to the operating room in minutes now, quickly, up this hospital corridor, as the patient is wheeled into the operating room, stand outside the door and listen as they try to save him. And maybe you'll learn what Professor Baker tried to learn about the dark mystery of life and death. Scalpel. Clap. The patient's failing, Doctor. Blood pressure? 62 over 40. Adrenaline. I can hear them trying to save me. But I'm going to die. And I want you to know that I'm dying. All because I made my wife murder me. Yes, I am dying. Because I conducted an experiment to influence my wife's subconscious mind to the point where she was going to murder me. Listen. Listen carefully. I will tell you exactly what happened. And when I have completed what I desire to communicate, go to the police. Tell them if you dare. I say dare. 
for it will require courage. It began this afternoon when Dr. Philip Simpson, the brilliant young brain surgeon, drove up in his station wagon from Palo Alto to address the San Francisco Medical Society and spend the night with us at the cottage Helen, my wife, and I had rented in the wooded hillside just across the Golden Gate Bridge, overlooking the ocean. He brought Chichi, one of two capuchin monkeys he kept under observation in his research laboratory. It's good to see you, Philip. It's so good to see you, Professor Baker. So, that's Chichi. Yes, he wants to get out. <laughs> Quiet town, Chi-Chi. Come on, you can come out. <laughs> Hello, Chi-Chi. <laughs> oh, you want to shake hands, too, of course. Welcome, Chi-Chi. Very affectionate. Astounding talent for mimicry. Oh, dear. <laughs> Get off Professor Baker's shoulder, Chi-Chi. Come on down. <laughs> he likes your hat. No, Chi-Chi. No. <laughs> All right, now you've tried it on. Give it back. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chi-Chi. He gets tired of wearing his black skull cap. Uh, Chi-Chi, let go of my hand. Now, you go you go on by yourself. He's always curious about new surroundings. Probably wants to explore that grove of trees. Go on, go on, Chi-Chi. <laughs> he won't go far. He'll play for a while and come back. Beautiful place you have here, Professor Baker. Is Helen home? Oh, she'll be back shortly. Had some shopping in the village. She just had to have abalone for you. She remembered how much you enjoy abalone. Oh, steak. wonderful, wonderful. How is she? You and Helen certainly could not have found a lovelier place for retirement. It is rather isolated, but then it does have that increasingly rare commodity, peace and quiet. Let's walk around back. Just beautiful. This view. Um, how about a cocktail? Well, why don't we wait for Helen? Well, she ought to be back any minute. We usually have our evening cocktail in the study. Gets foggy on the patio towards sundown. What about Chi-Chi? <laughs> He'll be all right. He'll open the patio door if it's left unlocked. Gets hysterical if he thinks he's been locked up. <laughs> Still like dry Manhattan? Perfect. Did you uh, tell Helen that you had asked me to bring T.T.? I uh, intended to. Slipped my mind. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Well, cheers. Hmm. Ah, that's good as ever. I, I hope Helen won't be upset. I'm sure she won't. I rather think she'll be intrigued with the idea of having Chi-Chi here for our experiments. Wait, you mean she's working with you on the research? Oh, yes. She's very cooperative. Finds it lots of fun. Well, that is interesting. Is she as intrigued as you seem to be with psychic studies? Well, frankly, I don't believe so. She's been very cooperative, but I don't think she really approves. Oh? Well, sometimes I question the wisdom of having married... At my age. Oh, come on now. I remind you, Philip, Helen is 20 years younger. I sometimes have the feeling she feels trapped, misses the activities of faculty wives she so enjoyed in the years before my retirement. Perhaps we'd had children. Philip, Helen should have married you when you were both graduate students. Well, there's... Uh, there's, there's nothing happened between you. No, Philip, not yet, but... Well, don't tell me that you, Professor Baker, an eminent physicist for 40 years, with worldwide reputation for scientific integrity, has succumbed to... to clairvoyance? And you, Phillips? Do you have irrefutable proof that clairvoyance does not ever exist? Can you issue an assurance that something will not happen? Oh, that's Helen now. Oh. Philip! Philip! Hello, Helen. As I look back now to that moment when Dr. Simpson and I waited for Helen to come into the house, I fully realize that the quick flush that passed over his tense face meant the one thing I had been blind to, that he was still in love with her. Helen entered the room with packages in her arms. She threw them on the sofa, rushed towards him, her face glowing with pleasure, embraced him and kissed his cheek. Hugged him. Oh, Philip, it's so good to see good you. Good to see you. Oh, let me look at you. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Neither one of them saw Chi-Chi open the door from the garden, come into the room, climb a table, and spring onto her shoulder, its furry paws around her neck. <coughs> Chi-Chi, come down, Chi-Chi. Let go of her. Come down. There, now stay down. <laughs> it's, it's a 
but monkey. Oh, I, I, I couldn't imagine what. Oh, all I saw and felt were hairy paws. <laughs> it's all right, Gigi. Oh. It's all right. Oh. Now, just be quiet. Oh. I'm, I'm so sorry he scared you, Helen. <laughs> he was trying to be affectionate. Yeah, well, I sure can do with a drink. <laughs> oh. Here you are, dear. Oh, thank you. Oh, he is cute, but uh, why the black skull cap? Well, you might say aesthetic reasons. Aesthetic? Or cosmetic. Philip doesn't like his little wards running around in public with their brains exposed. Brains exposed? Yes, that's right, Helen. The skull cap covers Chi-Chi's plastic skull. Now, I'll show you. There you are. Well, well you can see its brain. It's, it's positively fascinating. Mm. It, almost unbelievable. Oh, Philip, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant wait, surgery. Wait, wait a minute, Helen. I'm just carrying on what was begun in 1948 at the Naval Medical Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Really? I, I had no idea such surgery was possible that far back. Helen, my dear, there's a big gap in your knowledge of surgery. The ancient Egyptians operated on cranial bone. Mm-hmm, that's correct. Look here, Helen. Surgeons in a series of four operations removed cranial bone from the shaved head. And when the skull healed, fitted the metal ring around the edge of the skull, sealing the joint with rosin and wax. The clear plastic skull is held in place by these six steel bolts. Marvelous. Simply marvelous. Oh, it's practically routine now. Well, why was it done, Philip? Well, to study through the plastic skull, as I'm still studying, the flow of blood when the monkeys are in an induced state of shock or under the influence of anesthesia or drugs like adrenaline, histamine. And, of course, reactions to cold and hunger. Diet, fear, tension, so forth. Uh, incidentally, I'm, I'm leaving Chi-Chi here for a while. Here? Oh, I'm sorry, Helen. I simply forgot to tell you. Yes, but why? I mean, why is it being left here? What Philip is too polite to say, my dear, is that he's loaning Chi-Chi to me for extrasensory and paranormal experiments. To make my own observations. I believe he hopes to convince me that the brain monkeys or man's fails to respond with a measurable reaction to mental energy messages. Exactly. Look, I I'm curious. Why must the experiment be with a monkey when a dog, a, a horse? Philip understands, don't you, Philip? Well, Helen, in the scale of intelligence among animals, the monkey has the highest ability to learn next to man. Oh, oh Philip, what time is your lecture? Well, I should be at the academy by eight. Good. Give us enough time for another cocktail. And not have to rush through dinner. Uh, darling, please shake up another round. I'll take these packages to the kitchen. Well, here, here, let me carry them in. Oh, well, just, just put them on the counter, Philip. Mm hmm. Anything else I can help you with? Just show me where things are. I'll help set the table. What is it, Helen? You all right? Yes. The table. The table. What are you talking about? I said I'd help set the table. Oh, well, later. Let's let's have our drink and talk. There's so much to catch up with, Philip. More coffee, Philip? Mm, yes, please. Oh, have some more of the strawberries, Philip. And ice cream. Well, just, just a little. <laughs> Helen, what you've been telling me is hardly believable. Well, there's no room for disbelief, Philip. There's evidence. Evidence? Yes. I'll get the drawings. Excuse me. Be right back. They're in the study. I don't like it, Helen. Do you have these dizzy spells often? Well, they, they've been more frequent recently. Well, you should stop participating in such experiments. I'll talk to William. Oh, please don't. Please. Here we are. Philip, look at these rough line drawings. Do they suggest? Recognizable objects? Hmm. Well, this this might be an apple, I guess. This, uh, well, suggests a knife. You can't see anything in this one. Meaningless lines. Yes, that one is meaningless. Note the dates on the drawings. About a month ago, I sat at this table with three objects in my hands. An apple, a knife, and a salt shaker. Helen was stretched out on her back in the bedroom, her mind clear of any thoughts or feelings, awaiting my energy message. She could not hear me. She could only receive my thoughts, my instructions. 
I sent a message for her to pick up the pad and pencil on the night table. I sent an energy message telling her I was holding an apple, a knife, and a salt shaker, and for her to draw them. She got two out of three. <laughs> you ask me to accept this as evidence that you can control the actions of the mind of a person who is out of your sight, out of the sound of your voice, even physically in another place? Oh, <laughs> I call it coincidence. Accident. It did happen, Philip. In many other experiments we did together, it took me months of training to achieve a state of receptivity. Well, that's all very interesting. But I'd better soon be on my way to the academy. I can see you're still skeptical. Can you spare three more minutes for another, as you say, interesting experiment now? Right here with Helen? With Helen? I'd rather not. I don't mind, Philip. All right, very well. Thank you, Helen. Lie down in the bedroom. I'll give you two minutes to achieve receptivity. I will repeat once more, Helen. Come back, pick up the coffee pot, and pour the coffee right on your fine lace tablecloth. You're not going to let her... No, this gong will stop her. More coffee, Philip. Uh, well, I, I really should be going. Oh, yes, before the bridge traffic gets heavy. Here, I'll help you carry these things to the kitchen. He followed her into the kitchen, carrying a tray. The brilliant Dr. Simpson had been puzzled. Are you all right? He had asked her. Dr. Simpson, who recognized only the physical laws of matter, had asked, are you all right? But she wasn't all right. Dr. Simpson didn't know then what the trouble was. But late that night, when he returned from his lecture, he found out about the experiment that was underway with the loaded gun in the night table. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Ms. Goldilocks, you're drinking the sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay, here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, yes, this one's just right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> What's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? Your ShopRite is featuring ShopRite or Shenandoah brand grade A rock Cornish hens. A real family treat at just 47 cents a pound. What's for breakfast? Listen to these ShopRite values. ShopRite grade A large eggs, 59 cents a dozen. ShopRite sliced bacon, one pound package, 79 cents. ShopRite grade double A butter, one pound brick, 69 cents. Crown top white bread, 22 ounce loaves, three for a dollar. Save on every meal at ShopRite. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. WOR New York, your mystery theater station. I didn't wait up for Dr. Simpson to return. I waited in the study, dark, but for the small lamp on my desk. And still, except for the soft breathing of Chi-Chi asleep in the shadowy corner of the sofa, I waited and read until I could be sure that Helen was sound asleep. I unlocked my desk and took out the one notebook I kept hidden from her and made an entry. 
The experiment is beginning to show results. Today, Helen reacted with an unmistakable manifestation of dizziness and mental depressiveness when Dr. Simpson mentioned the word table. I am convinced that the subject has reached the stage of complete susceptibility and receptiveness. Then I continued the experiment. I stared in the direction of the bedroom door and concentrated. I shut out every sight and sound and thought until I was oblivious to everything but the task at hand. Helen, there is a gun in the night table. In the night table, Helen. In the night table, a gun, Helen. In the night table, a gun, Helen. Professor Baker. Baker. Yes? What? What are you doing? Experimenting. Where's Helen? Lying down in the bedroom. Close the door, won't you? Professor, what is this experiment? It's a very simple experiment. I'm trying to reach a mind. Now, if you'll excuse me. Helen, there is a gun in the night table. Stop it. Stop. Why, you're shaking, Dr. Simpson. What are you up to? I'm simply trying to tell Helen there is a gun in the night table by her bed. And for her to... To what? To pick it up. Enter this room. Point the gun at me and pull the trigger. But why? Why? What I'm trying to determine is whether one mind can influence another by exerting mental energy to do something the subject would normally recoil from doing. Yes, yes, go on. In Helen's case, I'm sure that in her conscious hours, she would never even entertain the thought of shooting me. I'm trying to determine whether she can be made to do just that without her being aware that she is being impelled to do so. Well, but why? What, what would it prove? Prove? Don't you see? If one mind can control another across space, think of the power men of goodwill can exercise over evil. It will at long last give man control over the rapacious breed that makes civilization a nightmare. The evil, power-hungry men who brainwash their countrymen into one war after another. Uh, Professor, how long has this been going on? For weeks. Every night. You recall Helen's depressiveness this evening? When you mentioned the word table? Uh, you mean... Yes. The reaction. Results. My mind is beginning to control her subconscious. You, you witnessed it, Philip. And now, have you the scientific integrity and the courage to witness the experiment carried through? I have conditioned her to come in when the clock strikes midnight. In a few minutes now. What? What do you mean, do I have the courage? Yes. To stand by and not interfere when or if she's about to pull the trigger to kill me. You... You mean the gun is loaded? Of course it is. But wh why not blank bullets? The experiment must be carried out with all factors of reality to eliminate all possibility of interference from her extrasensory perception. I, I don't understand. Don't you see? Her extrasensory perception could signal her subconscious mind that the gun is harmless and the experiment would prove nothing. Professor Baker, I, I simply cannot understand how a man like you, who's devoted 40 years to the science of physics, can suddenly... On retirement from scholastic life, devote all his time to such, such elusive matters as parapsychology, mental telepathy, clairvoyance, fantastic nonsense. You sound very dogmatic for a man of science, Dr. Simpson. With all due respect to your sincerity and your experiments, Professor Baker, the vast array of scientific knowledge still supports the theory that human behavior can be traced directly to the physical and chemical factors of the human body. And you think Chi-Chi will convince me of that? Precisely. You allow for no distinction between man and the monkey? None, none. Both are animals. Listen to me, Philip. You've been trying to dissuade me. Well, I'm quite aware of that. Now let me try to convince you. All right, I'm listening. 
From the time the British Society for Psychical Research was founded in 1882, right through the present worldwide experimentation to pierce the veil of the unknown, the one thing that has been missing is the willingness of scientists of unquestioned integrity to conduct their own experiments. The time has come, Philip, for researchers like you and me to settle once and for all what is or is not possible, is or is not true in paranormality. If I consent to witness your experiment, will you promise me that if it fails, tonight, now, you will never again experiment with Helen's mind? Yes. But, Philip, I can see you're still afraid that the experiment will succeed and that she could shoot me. I'll put you at ease. This gong that stopped her from pouring the coffee on the table. Here, you hold it. And if you think the situation warrants, strike the gong. Very well. Proceed. He stood by the door to the study, one hand holding the brass gong by its silk braid, his eyes watching the clock on the mantel as it started to strike midnight. Chi-Chi, awakened by the clock and our raised voices, was nervously pacing back and forth across the top of the back of the sofa. Philip watched the door. I sensed he was prepared if Helen failed to respond to the gong. He would strike the gun out of her hand. I resume the experiment. Pick up the gun. Come into the study, Helen. The study, Helen. Helen walked in, her eyes fixed and staring, her arms at her side, her right hand slightly behind her, Philip mouth open, unable to utter a word, watching her. Point the gun at me. Pull the trigger. Helen! Dr. Simpson dropped the gun. Rush to me. As I slumped over the desk... Good God. The bullet hit in my chest. Helen! Towels, adhesive tape, it's a chest wound. Have to keep him from sucking in air. He looked up from examining the wound. One glance told him she didn't hear or understand. He ran to the bathroom, got towels and the tape. Helen, call an ambulance. He moved me to the couch, pillows under my head, ripped open my shirt, pressed the towel on the wound, taped my chest to keep the pressure on the wound. Call the ambulance, Helen. She didn't respond. He seized the phone. What? Down the phone, Philip. Helen. Helen, why are you pointing the gun at me? Put down the gun. She lowered the gun to her side. He went to her. My eyes closed. I struggled against the blackness flooding my mind. I struggled as the blood trickled from my wound to listen. Helen, don't you hear me? Answer me. Answer me! Uh, uh, Why did you slap me, Philip? Helen, do you know what you've done? What what have I done? You've shot him. Who? Your husband, Professor Baker. We've got to call an ambulance, Helen. His pulse, his pulse is... Will... Will he live? The ambulance, Helen. He won't live, will he? I can see it in your face, Philip. He won't live. He'll die if he doesn't get to the operating room. I want him to die. What did you say? I want him to die! Well, I must say, I'm surprised too. But then, Helen's probably like most women. Not always mean what they say or say what they mean, huh? Wonder what's really on her mind. But... She's in good hands, with a doctor in the house. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. When you say bye, wiser. When you say but, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say but, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. When you say but. You've said the word that means you like to do it all When you say bud It means you want the beer that's got a taste that's number one 
when you say that. You tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say but, you say you care enough to only want the king of beers. There is no other one, there's only something less. Because the king of beers is leading all the rest. When you say but, wiser, you've said it all. And Isa Bush, St. Louis. People who fly a lot get to know the difference between one airline and another. And it's these frequent flyers who tell us they're more comfortable flying on TWA. What is comfort on an airplane? It's coach on our wide-body 1011, where all seats are two across. It's 1011 first class, where seats swivel around so you can talk or have dinner with friends. TWA Comfort is a roomy 747 with contoured seats you can sit in for five hours without getting fidgety. And Comfort is the TWA twin seat in 707 Coach, which lets you fold down the middle section if nobody's there and sit two across instead of three. On long TWA flights, you'll also have a choice of meals and movies on movie flights. But above all, you'll be comfortable. That's what TWA Ambassador Service is all about. Only TWA flies the wide-body 1011 to Los Angeles and the big, comfortable 747 to San Francisco. Call your travel agent or TWA for reservations. seem we left both Helen and Dr. Simpson in a state of shock, not to mention our bleeding Professor Baker and that hysterical Chi-Chi. Let's rejoin them and see whether there's help for any of them. I don't want him to die. Listen to me, Helen. You must let me call the ambulance. Don't you see? We must. If he dies here, the police will want to know why we didn't call the ambulance. The, the police? Yes, Helen, the police will want to know. Oh, Philip. Hold me. I'm so mixed up. Come, come. Oh, Sit down. God. Lean back. Just try to relax. Put the gun on the floor. I'll call the hospital. This is Dr. Philip Simpson. Yes, Doctor. I need the ambulance trauma team at once. 47 Edgecliff Road. Critical chest wound. Gunshot. Yes, Doctor. I'll put it right through. Now, now I want you to call the police, Helen. The, the police? Yes, they'll be here soon anyway. They're always alerted about requests for an ambulance. But I want you to call them for the record. It will be important at the trial. I'll get them on the phone. You talk. Oh, this... This is Mrs. William Baker. 47 Edgecliff Road. I want to report that... I just... shot my husband. What will I tell them when they get here, Philip? You don't have to answer any questions tonight. I'll have the law firm of Kendall Prentice represent you. They're specialists in forensic medicine. The Chinese gong in the dining room. It's Chi-Chi, imitating what I did. Chi-Chi, stop that. You hear me? Stop that. Let me have it, Chi-Chi. Now come here. Drop it. Drop it. Let go. Let go of it or I'll break your fall. <sighs> Those capuchin monkeys. They want to imitate every new thing they see. Chi-Chi, go sit down in that corner. Go on. And stay there. They're intelligent, but they can be very trying. Chi-Chi is... Chi-Chi is acting strangely tonight. Usually obeys a command immediately. Well, perhaps Chi-Chi's nervous system has been affected by... by what's happened here. Perhaps its brain has intercepted some of William's energy messages. Nonsense, Helen. That's impossible. I mean, Chi-Chi can sense excitement and tension in a room, but as for intercepting Professor Baker's energy messages, uh-uh. I'd, I'd better check his pulse. And weak. Very weak. What's keeping that anger? Philip! Chi-Chi's got the gun! 
Titi! Titi! Let me have that gun. Now, Titi, now you'll be a nice boy. Put put the gun on the floor. Good boy, good boy. Thank you, Titi. Thank you. Now go back in the corner and please stay there. I'll put the gun on the desk. I think we both need a brandy. Would you like one, Helen? Oh, yes, please. Here, dear. Now just, just sip it. Mm-hmm. Tell me, Helen. Did, did you know what you were doing when you pulled the trigger? Well, what, what do you think, Philip? I don't know what to think yet. You've got to tell me, Helen. Did you know what you were doing? You pulled the trigger after I struck the gong. Yes, I know. You, you knew? You deliberately murdered him. Murder? I shot him because he told me to. He made me do it. But if you knew, if you knew what you were doing, the police will call it murder. Look, I I told you I knew what I was doing, but I won't tell the police. What, what will you tell them? That, that the experiment, the, the great Professor Baker's experiment was a success. Wait a minute, you knew about the experiment? You knew? Yes, every step of it. I knew about the notebook. I read every entry, every day. I knew exactly what he was up to. The, the police will read the notebook and they'll understand. They'll understand. You, you murdered him, Helen. I, I never loved him. I was beginning to hate him. It doesn't matter now, Helen. I prefer to conclude that you did not know what you were doing. That the experiment did unbalance your mind. I think the district attorney will accept that. Except what, Philip? That when you pulled that trigger, it was insanity. Oh, no. No, I won't be declared insane. No. No, no. Look, I'll show them the notebook. They'll understand. They'll read it in his own handwriting. How, how night after night while I was asleep, he, he tried to make me shoot him. They'll understand. Unless you tell them differently. Unless you tell them I murdered him. Helen. Helen, please listen to me. Try to understand what I'm telling you. The police will never believe that Professor Baker's experiment was a success. They'll call in scientists to testify that no such thing is possible. They'll suspect that you used your knowledge of the experiment to kill your husband. Yes, but you, you were a witness. You can verify what happened. Yes, but the... You tell them that I murdered him? No. No, 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 oh. Helen. The only honest opinion I can give them is that your mind snapped. Oh. That day by day, the knowledge of your husband's secret experiment preyed on your mind. And you became convinced, in a moment of temporary insanity, that he really wanted you to kill him. Will will they believe that? I hope the jury will. (laughs) Help me, Philip. You must help me. I'm so tired. I'm so mixed up. As I lay there on the couch, still, my eyes closed, aware that under the blanket, my blood was still slowly trickling into the towel, fighting against slipping off into unconsciousness. I could still hear their voices as from a great distance. You must help me. I'm so tired. I'm so mixed up. My poor darling. And then I was aware of Chi-Chi at the side of the couch, bending over me, its breath close to my face. My eyelids, heavy with weariness, lifted slightly, and through the thin slit of vision, I saw Chi-Chi's plastic skull. I could see plainly through the plastic skull, the gray mass of nerve tissue of the cerebellum, and then, summoning every last bit of strength of will, I concentrated on Chi-Chi's brain. Chi-Chi... The gun in the desk, Chi-Chi. Oh, what have I done, Philip? You two have ruined your career. Go to the desk, Chi-Chi. In the drawer, the gun. I could see its gray eyes staring at me, trying to grasp what I was telling him. And then he jumped on the desk, pulled open the drawer, and took out the gun. Chi-Chi! Put it down, Chi-Chi! Philip, charge to the desk. 
Chi-Chi eluded him, leaped to the mantel over the fireplace. Drop the gun, Chi-Chi. Drop it! Philip chased it all over the room and knocked over the table lamp. It jumped to the hanging ceiling light fixture, waving the gun playfully. Chi-Chi points the gun at the mirror. At the mirror, Chi-Chi. Drop it! Drop it! Give me the gun, Chi-Chi! At the mirror... Pull the trigger. Oh, give me the gun, Chi-Chi. Helen was reaching towards Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi was pointing the gun at her. I didn't want Helen to die. I summoned every last ounce of will and sent a mental message to Chi-Chi. Drop the gun, Chi-Chi. Drop the gun. Look out, Helen. Good Lord. Helen. Helen. Answer me. She didn't have a chance. She was shot in the head. Oh, oh, my child. Oh, oh, my child. You must not die, Helen. You must not die. Helen, I love you. Oh, my child. Chichi was at the door at the garden in a panic, trying to open the door, the gun still in his hand. Philip grabbed the fireplace poker, swung it on Chichi's plastic skull, glanced off and fell out of his hand. You! Philip picked up a chair, threw it at Chichi with all the strength of his fury. It crashed through the glass. Chichi jumped through the opening. Philip picked up the poker, went after Chichi. I could hear Philip chasing him across the flagstones of the patio. I heard the police car. I could hear Philip shouting. Chichi! Then, all was still, deathly still. I lost consciousness until I became aware of someone talking on the telephone. Yes, Lieutenant. Two dead. Mrs. Baker in the house and a Dr. Uh, Philip Simpson in the woods back of the house. Yeah, one bullet in each of them. John says Dr. Simpson was pretty far gone when he found him. Says he tried to tell him something. John thinks it was something about uh, a monkey still running around out there with a loaded gun. It beats me too, Lieutenant. No, no, nothing else. Oh, yes, uh, we found a black skull cap hanging on the chandelier. That's what I said, skull cap. Hard-shaped thing. Can't figure out what it's for, no. Right. Oh, better get that ambulance out here fast. Professor may still have a chance. Here it comes now, Lieutenant. That's how it happened. Exactly how it happened. The police are still puzzled. Chi-Chi will probably find roaming the woods the gun somewhere nearby. Chichi did it. Tell the police. Chichi did it. Why? Perhaps it was mimicking Helen after it witnessed her shooting me. I shall never know. As as for whether my wife murdered me willfully or suffered temporary insanity or was influenced by my mental energy you must judge for yourself after you read the full record of the experiment in the notebook yes go tell the police and Professor Seligson you can locate him through the American Society of University Professors tell them I decided to communicate the foregoing just an hour ago when I heard the operating team give me up. And they say dead men tell no tales. Talking about the brain, though, let me give you men a tip. If your wife is trying to talk you to death, don't worry. Master the secret of mind over chatter. But seriously, a guy I know 
didn't even answer his wife. She threatened to divorce him because he was unsociable. So he hit her over the head with a mashie, told the jury he wanted to be clubby. I'll be back shortly. Amco Transmissions, may we help you? I hope so. My frisky Ford is making funny noises. Oh, like what? Like this. Hey, that's great. You mean everything's okay? No, no, I was admiring your car sounds. As for your Ford, ma'am, well, I'd have to look at it to tell you exactly what's wrong. But I can say of the three million automatic transmissions Amco serviced, over 900,000 of them were Fords. You can cure my buzzes? Oh, you bet. We've gotten stranger sounds than that out of... Ford, Torino, and the Maverick, and the Mustang, and the Pinto, and the LTD. Rest assured, we'll get rid of your buzzes. Oh, terrific. I'll zoom... Excuse me. Ah, right down. Nobody knows your automatic transmission better than Amco. Double A. MCO. There are over 500 Amco centers coast to coast. Consult your yellow pages for the Amco center near you. Double A. MCO. Amco. Our cast included Roger DeCoven, Bryna Rayburn, and Nat Poland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The W.O.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets.